on GGSP, we take the hungry pink superstar Kirby on a crazy big adventure in our review of Kirby and the Forgotten Land. Plus, a look back at some of the coolest Star Wars video games ever. Punch it, Chewie! Not him, the Falcon. <laughs> Welcome to GGSP. I'm Rad. And I'm Jem. We are really hitting that nostalgia button this week with those old Star Wars games, Rad. Oh, uh, yeah, we got to get into the galactic groove before Lego Skywalker Saga. Hello, Rad. Hello, Jem. Hi, Hi Dad. So, I took your advice, Jem, and have been doing some more advanced lessons on how to speak astrobeck. <clears throat> Beep, bo boop, bleep, wow. That's great, Darren, except we don't know Astromech, so I have no idea what you just said. <gasps> I said Anakin Skywalker's a big noob. <gasps> oh, shh, Darren! I would not talk that way about someone that knows the dark side of the Force. Yeah, but, you know, keep practising, Darren, you'll get there. Beep bop, beep bop. How about we cross now to the scoop desk with Jax for the latest news. Play any good games this week? I tried Hopscotch for the first time. Nice. Wait, what? Uh, welcome to the weekly gaming scoop from around the world. Uh, yes, our, our first story this week is something of a cipher. Players from all over the world have been playing Tunic and translating its secret language. Tunic was our first five rubber chicken game review for this year. Jem mentioned there was a secret language in the game, made up of tiny runes. Well, players from around the world have already started working together to translate it. So far, we have the letter F and a few vowels. One of the game's developers said it wouldn't be as simple as a letter-to-letter -letter cipher to English. It's far more cryptic than that. Sounds like a challenge to me. Oh, hey, you wouldn't happen to have a universal translator built in, would you? I do have a translator, but it is not universal. The only languages I have are Spanish and dinosaur. Oh, well, como estas? <coughs> Next up, we've talked a lot about world records, but what if it's the video game character breaking them? Kirby in his new game, The Forgotten Land, is not forgotten after all. In fact, he's been breaking records all over the world as the most popular game launch in the series. During the opening weekend in Japan, the game sold over 380,000 copies, making it the biggest launch in the history of the Kirby franchise. And in the UK, the game reached number one in physical cartridge sales, making it number one. Looks like a new era for Kirby. Okay, let's see what's next. FIFA could be changing its name. FIFA, the famous football game made by EA Sports, has been having some trouble with its name recently. Turns out the actual FIFA, the international governing body of football, is trying to charge EA $1 billion for the right to use its name. Imagine paying that much just to use a name. Imagine having a name. EA has already started the process to change the game's name, with the most likely choice being EA Sports Football Club, or EA Sports FC. Not super catchy if you ask me. Oh, I know! If you want to help name FIFA, send in your name suggestions. Well, no, no, there shall be no other name naming competitions until we find mine, thank you very much. In fact, I have taken the time to pick some more lovely names I think will suit me. Number one is from Albert, and it is the electronic verbalizer of interesting entertaining gaming news, or Evie for short. Fun fact, Jax, did you know that the name Evangeline means messenger of good news? So the Evie name actually has two meanings. Number two is from Sebastian, and it's the name Scoop Analyzing Robot Indicator, or Sari. And finally, from Ethan, we've got the Game Analyzing Robot Friend, or Garv. Some great suggestions there. Well, that's all the news we've got for you this week. We'll be keeping an eye out for more stories as well as a name for you. The much anticipated Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga is finally out. But before we bring you our full review of that next week, we're getting into the Star Wars spirit by taking a look at some family-friendly Star Wars games from over the years. Oh, and there have been a bantha load, spanning all sorts of different game genres. But first, let us cast our minds back a long time ago to a gaming platform far, far away. 
The first officially licensed Star Wars game was 1982's arcade-style scrolling shooter for the Atari 2600, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. It was based on the AT-80 battle on Hoth that takes place at the start of the film. The original Star Wars film trilogy went on to inspire all sorts of video games. Like the Super Star Wars series for the Super Nintendo that really kicked things into hyperspace in the early 90s. These vibrant blast -em up platformers did a great job of capturing the sense of adventure and atmosphere of the films. And they included some sweet vehicle-based levels too. Ah uh, yes, one of my favourite things about Star Wars is all the cool space vehicles. So it's lucky there are heaps of games that let you jump into the driver's seat, or pilot seat. Like the Star Wars Rogue Squadron trilogy. Here you could pilot X-Wings and other craft in dogfights, defending the Rebel Alliance against Imperial forces. Or in the spaceflight combat simulation of the Star Wars X-Wing series on PC. There was also Star Wars Super Bombad Racing, which was an okay little kart racer for PlayStation 2. And Star Wars Episode 1 Racer, which delivered all the thrills of pod racing across interplanetary terrain. And sure, the 2021 remaster had some less than ideal controls that might not quite stack up against today's carters. But I am contractually obliged to say the following whenever this game is mentioned. <clears throat> Now this is pod racing. Now we really should mention the series that has pretty much established its own signature genre of Star Wars games. Lego Star Wars. Developer Traveler's Tales first gave Star Wars the Lego game treatment in 2005 with loads of lols, music and sounds from the films. It was co-op puzzle perfection and an all-round smashing good time. LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga is perhaps the best of the bunch, covering the events of episodes one to six with a huge roster of characters, each with their own special abilities. Mmm, the force is strong with this game, wouldn't you say, Jem? Well, I mean, if we're keeping with Star Wars lore, the best way to determine that would be with a midichlorian count, right? Oh, right! Uh, midichlorians are those microorganisms that are responsible for force sensitivity or something. Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure if we can apply this to games, but hey, let's have a look. Uh, can we please get a midichlorian count for LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga, please? Ooh, what's that? 17,500. Mm, that's close to Yoda levels. Nice. The LEGO games are always a light-hearted romp, but there are a few Star Wars games that explore the serious side of the galaxy, like 2003's Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Knights of the Old Republic, or KOTOR, is a role-playing game or RPG set in the Star Wars universe thousands of years before the events of the main series storyline. And you know, I love me a big epic sci-fi RPG, and KOTOR is one of the greats. You get to build out your character and make meaningful in-game decisions, along with strategic combat and a gripping narrative filled with interesting characters. It's deep, detailed and delves right into all the rich dynamics at play in this world of the Republic and the Sith. And it spawned a sequel, which was also quite well received. Let's get a midichlorian count, shall we? Whoa! That's like Anakin Skywalker levels! I'm not surprised. Versions of the original are still playable on PC, Xbox, Switch and mobile, and there's a remake in the works for the PS5. While games like KOTOR certainly show how great a Star Wars game can be, there are some that have fallen short. Like Star Wars Yoda Stories, originally a PC game from 1997, it was panned for its boring, lackluster gameplay. The Force is definitely not strong in this one. Ugh, that's a midichlorian score of two. That same year, fighting game Star Wars Masters of Terrace Kasi was released for the first PlayStation. Some consider this to be the worst Star Wars game of all time. And it gets a midichlorian rating of two as well. Now, there have also been countless other spin-off and crossover games that have adopted the Star Wars theme, to varying degrees of success. Like numerous Star Wars pinball games, the bejeweled-like match-three Star Wars puzzle droids, 
or the surprisingly good Angry Birds Star Wars. If you like the core games here, you'll probably enjoy their Star Wars skinned versions to some extent. But no discussion of Star Wars games would be complete without mentioning Kinect Star Wars. Oh boy. Okay, well I think we can agree that it was not a good game overall, we must never forget those iconic galactic dance-off sequences. Chlorian stats. All right, all right, we're seeing some reasonable levels here. Interesting. Oh, but now we're on the Emperor? Ugh, yikes. When you try dancing and floor length ropes, they're heavy. I didn't know the Emperor could move like that. Frankly, I didn't want to know. And is now the time to admit I don't really understand how our midichlorian scale works here. <laughs> don't overthink it. OK, well, there you go, young Padawans, the highs and lows of the varied saga of Star Wars video games. And I can't wait to play the Skywalker saga. Oh, same. Can we dress up? Can the Millennium Falcon make the Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs? People say that that doesn't really make sense because a parsec is a measurement of distance and not time. Although Han Solo could have been taking a different route through a bunch of black holes or something, so maybe it is possible to actually do it in 12 parsecs. Although, okay, it... right. Probably enough Star Wars talk for now. Let's answer some of these fine questions, starting with this video question from Lucas. Hi, GGSP, it's me, Lucas. I've got two questions for you today. One, how do you get Brewster in Animal Crossing New Horizons? And two, how do you get rid of villages you don't like in Animal Crossing New Horizons? Plus, Darren, goodies for me, please. <clears throat> I am Darren. I am happy. I am nothing. Thank you. Bye. Uh, hello? Hello, Rad and Jim. It's Darren. I thought since I made some exemplary emoticons that I could answer this question for Lucas. OK, Darren, go for it. Ah, affirmative. To get Brewster, you'll need to have the free 2.0 update. First, you have to speak to Blathers at your island's museum, who tells you he wants to track down his old friend Brewster. Then head to the Cap'n, who will take you to Cap'n Island. Once you arrive at the location, wander around until you see Brewster and speak to him. It's the bird! Hi, bird! Then let Blathers know back home, and the next day, Brewster and the roost will be on the second floor. Ah, ah, do you think Brewster could make Robochinos for me? What would that even taste like? I don't think I really want to know, honestly. Uh, but moving on. Now, I know how to get rid of annoying villagers. <coughs> Chops. Uh, but what do you think is the best way, Darren? If you aren't seeing eye to eye with a particular villager, try avoiding any conversation or interaction with them and mention to Isabel that you don't want them on your island. It is a slower method, but if you truly must. Or you could try the gem way and swat them with a net until they go. You know, up to you. Uh, speaking of island getaways, Darren, you were planning a trip, weren't you? Ah, uh, you know, uh, no robot is an island. <laughs> Bye. Oh, bye, Darren. <laughs> you know, an oil rig is a robot island. All right, now let's move on to this video question from Ava. Hi, GGSP. My name's Ava, and I have two questions for you. Have you reviewed Sky Children of the Light on Nintendo 2. If you could make any game, what would it be? And Jem, please do these. Oh, sweet. I can do that. <laughs> Potato in a hat. I'm a noob. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Ava. We have not reviewed Sky Children of the Light, but we have mentioned it in Ask SPs a few times in past eps. It's a beautiful open world adventure game developed by the peeps who also made Journey. You play as the Children of the Light, soaring and exploring seven unique realms, meeting interesting characters along the way and saving spirits. 
it's free to play. In saying that, the game is heavily focused on social mechanics. Similar to Journey, you can meet other players online who can help you with your mission. There's also many cosmetic items that look enticing to buy, but they are microtransactions that involve real money. So please check with your guardians of gaming if you're unsure. Now onto what kind of game we would create. Well, you know me, mine would be an epic space game. Like a cross between Outer Wilds and My Time at Porsche, where I can search and collect minerals to build bases and spacecrafts, then go explore other fascinating planets and maybe meet some cool alien friends along the way. Ah, oh, to see the universe from our humble den of gaming. Indeed. Well, I think I'd want to make a really cool, like, tricky puzzle game. Maybe Portal 2 meets the pedestrian. It would have a cool art style and the clever puzzles would really make you think. But also, now that I think about it, coming up with ideas for puzzles seems really hard. Oh, oh, oh! What about a mix of Dota 2 and Tricky Towers? You know, like, you've got your team of five and there are Ted Trominos and the map is there with the little shop. You've got to have quick reflexes for that one. How would that work, though? Oh, Jem, you just got to play it to see. I don't have time to explain it. We have to get to another video question. And this one is from Thomas. Hi, I'm Thomas, and I have two questions for you. One, what are some good recommendations for party games? Two, what is the highest selling product in Stardew Valley, and what's the easiest way to get it? Bye, thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Oh, ain't no party like a GGSP party. We've had tons of fun over the years with party games like the popular Mario Party Superstars and Overcooked series. If you like Human Fall Flat, then you'll love Gang Beasts, a multiplayer fighting game with hilarious physics. Or race to the top to become the best chicken horse in Ultimate Chicken Horse. Now, what would be the highest selling product in Stardew Valley? Well, that would be the Legend Fish. If you catch the best quality and have the right profession, it can sell for a whopping 15,000 gold. However, it can only be caught once. Ooh, tough gig. But I think that's all the time we have for Ask SP this week. We love your video questions and emoticons, so keep sending them in here. If your vid makes it into the show, you'll receive a GGSP merch pack with heaps of cool things like stickers and a hat or a beanie. Hey, Jam. Do you think that I could catch the legend fish? I mean, you are pretty good at fishing, so I think you could. Oh, thanks. I know. I was just fishing. <laughs> For compliments! Forgotten Land finally sees my precious pink boy taking the starring role in his own 3D adventure. And frankly, can't believe it's taken this long. Things start off on Kirby's home planet, Planet Popstar. He's just flying around on a star, living his best Kirby life, until giant cracks form in the sky and pull him and everyone else in. He then washes up on what looks like Crash Bandicoot's first level, but it turns out to be the cutest post-apocalypse ever. Yeah, even the bad guys here are just adorable. But bad guys they are, who have taken all the Waddle Dees hostage. So of course, Kirby sets out on a no-holds-barred mission to suck them up and free his planet folk. Along with being a famed sucker-upper of things, Kirby is also a renowned floaty boy, which makes light work of the platforming here. Oh, you want me to do some precise jumps over these here platforms? <laughs> no, thank you. I'ma just float. Yeah, Kerbs is a super overpowered, unstoppable force. Between his many powers, his floating, and heaps of health, even on harder difficulty, this is a pretty easy breezy adventure. But that's certainly not a bad thing, I think. Yeah, I liked the more laid back vibe of this, but that's not to say there isn't some decent challenge. Kerbs can't float forever and can only go up so high. And he moves real slow while floating. So you can't just float over the whole game. And they up the pressure with lots of little time challenges scattered throughout. And there are loads of these quick little side missions that test your skills a bit more. Plus, each level has heaps of hidden waddle dees to find. 
I loved how lots of the collectibles are actually useful. It just made me want to hunt them down even more. After a little while, the Waddle Dees set up a small town, which grows as you save more of them. And they run a shop, which lets you spend coins and collectibles to upgrade your already powerful powers. There are heaps of powers you can absorb, each with multiple versions, so you can tackle levels in different ways. Want to ice skate through a level? Maybe roll through them as a giant spiky ball? Or just break space and time itself? Curbs can do it all. And speaking of levels, there are some great ones. I especially love the ones set in the abandoned theme park with roller coasters and haunted houses. And I loved how the town kept getting new mini games and things to check out too. I do admit I got a bit obsessed with Tilt and Roll Kirby for a minute. Get in your hole, ball! Oh, and Gem! What? They have a fishing mini game! I know! But it's not very good. I got myself very hyped up for a second there, only to find it's just a little quick time event thingy. That is not fishing. What well, all that shouting does remind me, we should talk about mouthful mode. This lets Kirby take control of big things like cars, vending machines, pipes and all sorts. These make for great little moments where they just change up the game. I particularly love water-filled Kirby. His big sloshy belly brings me much joy. Yeah, I did love those bits. Although, speaking of variety, I was a bit disappointed by the boss fights. First off, there's not really much strategy to them. The bosses felt like big damage sponges, and I'd end up just standing next to them, spamming attacks and tanking through their hits. And they all get reused heaps. I lost count of how many times I fought some of them. Yeah, they're a bit of a weak spot. But we should also mention you can tackle this whole adventure in co-op. Only locally, though, so you will need to find a friend. Yeah, but while Player 1 gets to be Kirby, Player 2 gets stuck with being everyone's favourite character, Bandana Waddledee. He can't even absorb powers and only gets to use a pointy stick. And his name is Bandana Waddledee. Yeah, I can definitely see that causing a few fights over who gets to play as Kirby. Oh, you mean like how you always insisted in playing Kirby when we played together? Hey, Kirby is my idol. If I can't play as him, then no one can. But on that note, I really enjoyed this. It's just bright and silly fun. So I'm giving Kirby in the Forgotten Land four and a half out of five rubber chickens. It's a great first outing for Kirby in 3D. I love the way it was always throwing something new at me, which made it super fun and super hard to put down. I'm giving it four and a half out of five rubber chickens too. Well, we are almost out of time, but before we go, just a reminder that you can send in your audition videos to be a part of our GG Spawn Squad just head to our website at avc.net.au slash ggsp and click on the Spawn Squad tile. We want some of you GGS peeps to come to our studio here at the ABC and show off your awesome gaming skills. That's right, so apply now. Next week on the show... We're back to using the Force in an epic review of LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga. I need someone to show me my place in all this. Hmm. <sighs> oh, I hope it's wizard. Until next time, may the force be with you. Right out. Jam out.